we have a, a, two very impressive people speaking. I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Brendan Ozawa de Silva, who's about to get his second PhD, by the way. His first PhD, his first, second PhD is going to be from Emory in Buddhist studies. But uh, he already has a, an MPhil from Oxford in Russian and, U and Eastern European studies, a master in theological studies. And he is a, an, a, a, a very involved uh, with the Dalai Lama in developing, uh, uh, coordinating uh, His Holiness's work uh, in association with Emory University. Um, he's an associate professor at Life University in Marietta, Georgia. And he's an associate director for Buddhist studies and the practice uh, in, a, in a monastery, the Lucilling Monastery in Atlanta, Georgia. And so his first PhD is in modern history, by the way. Second PhD will be in Buddhist studies. And we welcome him uh, to begin uh, this very important uh, discourse, which is the intersection. This, these two papers will be the intersection uh, between mindfulness and the, and the whole area of therapy and clinical application and some of the crossovers, uh, paying attention to the contents of mindfulness, meditation within the context of secular ethics. Well, thank you all very much, um, and special thanks to uh, Lawrence for uh, inviting us here and for creating this opportunity. Um, I've been um, privileged to attend and uh, participate in some of the Mind and Life events, uh, not nearly as long as Geshe Jimpala, but um, for about the last 10 years or so, um, observing that. And uh, a lot of times I'm left with the feeling that, you know, uh, I wish we had much more time to discuss the, the cultural issues and the deeper theoretical issues and, and these contexts. And that's what this conference really allows us to do. And I'm really appreciating that. Um, I'm one of two closers for the day. You're probably quite tired from all the information and so forth uh, that you've received today. Also, um, uh, the two closers that you have, you've already seen our better halves today, so uh, I hope you have low expectations <laughs> for us, but we'll do our best. <laughs> so um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about has been wonderfully anticipated by the earlier speakers. Um, I'm going to ambitiously try to do four things today. Um, and first, talk about um, how we can understand mindfulness. Um, Geshe Jinpa earlier said that it's, uh, in his opinion, it's rather fruitless to try to draw connections between traditional accounts and contemporary accounts. So I heard that with some dismay. <laughs> Since that's, that's the first thing on my agenda. To, to, to be more specific, what I was trying to say was that modern definition of mindfulness, trying to fit that into the traditional definition of mindfulness, Right. That, that's what I meant. I meant very specific. <laughs> okay. I'm going to try not to do that. Uh, <laughs> um, second thing I want to talk about is, um, and Chicago alluded to this in her presentation already, is uh, the differentiation within the Buddhist tradition of analytical versus non-analytical styles of meditation, uh, chegom and jogom. And um, I think that can be very useful as we move forward. Um, uh, in 2005, at one of the Mind and Life events, after a bunch of uh, meditation teachers and researchers, including John kabat and others, Richie Davidson, had extolled the, the wonders of mindfulness, His Holiness actually said, you know, some of you should really be studying analytical mindfulness. I think that's actually even more helpful. Uh, and I think many people, including myself, were taken aback by that. Um, uh, but that's what we've been trying to do um, at Emory, and it's taking place elsewhere also. Uh, that's going to lead us to the specific meditation protocol that we're doing research uh, on at Emory called Cognitively Based Compassion Training. And um, unlike uh, non-analytical uh, um, styles of mindfulness and some contemporary forms of mindfulness, Cognitively Based Compassion Training is explicitly about values, about morals, about ethics. And so that connects with another idea, which is His, His Holiness the Dalai Lama's idea of secular ethics. Um, and that is going to lead me to some concluding remarks about the nature of culture and what we mean by culture and the, cultural, the culture, cultural values that are implicit in meditation practices and the way that meditation practices actually engage and can transform cultural values when people practice them. So um, 
Uh, obviously, uh, there are differences between traditional and contemporary uses of the term uh, mindfulness. Um, uh, in traditional accounts, it, it tends to be used as a translation of, of uh, these um, terms, smirti, sati, uh, drempa in Tibetan, uh, which, um, as um, Professor Scharf uh, brilliantly presented earlier, uh, are very different in terms of the way they feel and the way they sound. Uh, they, they have um, this ethical dimension, as he mentioned. They also have the idea uh, smirti or sati or drempa are also um, seen as, uh, uh, this term is used as one of the, um, uh, one of the mental factors that is basically a, a common um, aspect of cognition, of just cognitive processes, uh, particularly when an object, a mental object is ascertained. Um, as opposed to contemporary use of the term mindfulness to refer to a particular style of meditation practice, which is not the cultivation of non-judgmental present moment awareness. So uh, we've talked a little bit about the differences here. Um, I think that um, one, uh, I don't think that these two are the same or that it's necessary that we fit a contem the contemporary practice of mindfulness into an understanding of sati or smriti. But um, I think that um, one of the ways we can think about what's happening in mindfulness and in meditation practices in general, uh, is, um, is the idea, uh, and Geshe Jimpa also kind of referred to this when he talked about processing, that meditation is about processing, that we're talking about practices that involve holding uh, and retaining a specific mental content uh, in a working memory, uh, which can be an object of mind or it can also be a process of mind, I think, um, and then engaging that content either analytically or non-analytically. So if we're engaging it non-analytically, then that would be a stabilizing meditation where the object is simply retained uh, in working memory and held there statically. So in other words, it's, it's kind of kept in awareness um, and the, the object is to not allow it to go away from awareness. If it does go away, one brings it back and tries to hold it there with mindfulness. Or the object is observed and are analyzed in a structured way that brings insight. Uh, insight, of course, being the, the, uh, one of the um, terms uh, that's used to translate vipassana, a new awareness about the object. Um, so I think um, if we think about um, meditation uh, and mindfulness, contemporary mindfulness as a subset of meditation practices, um, then we can see that contemporary mindfulness-based interventions, so I'm thinking MBSR, MBCT, appear to be a subset of the full range of possible ways that mindfulness might be employed in meditation and that are available in the Buddhist tradition. So um, certain objects and processes are privileged in mindfulness-based interventions. So in other words, it is um, uh, the, the breath as an object or it is present mo or body sensations or present moment awareness. So this is um, a subset of all the possible types of content that could be held in mindfulness uh, um, in, in, in a meditation practice. Um, also, I wouldn't say that mindfulness-based interventions are totally non-analytical, that they just involve uh, stabilizing meditation because they are oriented towards gaining certain insights. Um, and th these are often made explicit in mindfulness-based interventions. So the object is to see thoughts as thoughts or to see thoughts as impermanent or to see the impermanent nature of experience. Uh, and Lauren raised this in her presentation on Vipassana. Um, th that type of insight uh, is sought through observation, uh, even though it isn't um, as analytical as a fully discursive kind of um, thinking about, you know, you're not supposed to sit there and think about, oh, my thoughts are, are just thoughts or something. You're supposed to observe it. But I think that still can be seen as uh, a, a form of um, uh, using analysis because it's oriented towards um, insight. So what I'm trying to offer here is a model for understanding um, mindful, contemporary mindfulness as a subset of meditation practices that involve these two, two components, choosing a certain content and then 
analyzing, observing that content along very structured lines in order to yield specific insights. We can also think of Nikon as this way. Um, Nikon's a structured practice that you're supposed to stay focused on a particular question, what have I received from this person? And that question is a, is a form of analytical meditation that's oriented to yield certain insights that are then transformative. Um, this slide says what I just said. Um, in, um, in the development, uh, when His Holiness said, um, you know, we should be looking at analytical meditation also, uh, one of the ways that this is understood in the Tibetan uh, tradition is um, through this model of uh, gomsum, which means the, uh, the, the trio of view, behavior, and meditation, or the threefold practice of uh, behavior, um, uh, view, behavior, and meditation. And the idea here is that by fine-tuning our understanding uh, or view uh, to better accord with the reality of our situations, we can alter our affective and behavioral responses. Um, but that this new understanding must become deeply ingrained through immersive meditative training. So as uh, Geshe Jinpa mentioned, uh, the idea is that um, if an insight is gained, it has to uh, be integrated, that knowledge has to be integrated. And again, that earlier model of meditation that I put up um, allows us to do that because once that insight is gained through analysis or observation, that new insight can then also be held non-analytically uh, so that it becomes more deeply ingrained. Um, so uh, this idea of um, analytical meditation uh, is often one that uh, people are somewhat unfamiliar with. Um, so um, I'll give an example. Um, and again, I don't want this to appear like a slight on contemporary mindfulness practices, because I, as I mentioned, I do think they contain elements of, of analysis actually in there. Um, but if you can imagine, um, and this is a very familiar um, Buddhist trope, although it's also used in non-Buddhist contexts in India, of um, mistaking the uh, a rope for a snake. So you see uh, you're in a dark place like a cave, and you see a coil of rope, but you actually mistake it uh, for being a snake, so you're afraid. So you have this certain view, this certain um, understanding of what the reality is out there, that there's a snake there, maybe, or maybe there's a snake, and then you have the affective response of fear, and then you um, uh, do crazy things that are uh, unhelpful. Like, I don't, I don't know what you do when you see a snake, and you scream and you run out of the cave. Um, so now you can think of a non if we understood mindfulness as simply a non-analytical practice, then what are you supposed to do in this situation? Uh, you're supposed to sit down and cross your legs <laughs> and, um, and, and just breathe. So there's a snake there, but I'm just going to breathe. You know, I'm just going to breathe and I'm going to be aware of the present moment. And I'm aware of my fear arising and I'm aware of my fear getting bigger. Now it's really big, but I'm aware it's impermanent, it's passing. <laughs> um, you can imagine that's not a terribly, uh, I, that would be somewhat helpful. Um, but um, the problem with that is then you arise from your meditation and you look and you say, oh my God, there's a snake there. And it's kind of, you know, you're not um, actually investigating the nature of reality to change your view, right? And no matter how long you do that, you haven't done anything that actually creates any change in your, in your view. So. Um, so the, a difference would be, you know, this idea of, of maybe you start by doing that. You start by taking a few deep breaths. So you calm your mind. But then the next step is you actually investigate. Is there really a snake there or not? So you're like this um, spelunker or this uh, private eye. <laughs> or, or you're like a scientist. Um, and the idea here is that you... you really examine from different angles and through observation and try to see, is this really true? So you, you go over and maybe first, you know, with a long stick, you kind of prod uh, the, the snake and you notice it doesn't move and then you take, get out your flashlight and you approach it and so on. And the more you do this, the, it starts to dawn on you, maybe this is just a rope. And eventually, if you've, you've engaged this analysis from many different angles, you become convinced it's just a rope. And then you integrate that knowledge uh, in, and that changes. And, and the instant you do that, the instant you become convinced that it's just a rope, the instant you know it's just a rope, then fear is totally gone. Another example is, um, uh, that Mathieu Ricard uses is, is you're out there on a lake in a boat, 
and uh, you're enjoying this beautiful, you know, wonderful uh, day, and it's so peaceful on the lake, and then uh, another boat comes along and hits you, and you think, oh, who is that person who's, you know, so reckless, and they crashed into my boat, and, you know, they, we, they could even sink my boat, and you get up and you turn around, and there's no one there, right? The instant you see there's no one there, your anger vanishes. So that's the power of insight. Now, if you didn't turn around and you just sat there and said, I'm going to breathe and I'm going to, you know, can deal with my anger and everything. Of course, you could regulate your anger. You could regulate your emotions to some extent. But the instant you have that insight, there's no need to regulate your emotional response anymore because it's instantly transformed. Um, so um, that same year that uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama mentioned that at the Mind and Life Conference, um, Geshe Lobsang Tenzin, who's director of the Emory Tibet Partnership, uh, and uh, like Geshe Jinpa uh, received his Geshe Laram degree um, in the Tibet, from the uh, large Tibetan monasteries and also a PhD um, from Emory. Um, uh, he developed this practice called cognitively based compassion training, which was adapted from the Tibetan Buddhist Lojong uh, tradition, uh, but rendered into secular form, and I'll say a little more about that later, what that means. Um, and it was developed uh, specifically as a protocol for research on compassion. Uh, and since then, it's been studied in several research ses uh, settings and also some outreach programs, which I'll talk about. Um, CBCT includes the practice of mindfulness as a key component, but then uses mindfulness uh, both for analytical and non-analytical styles of meditation to develop insights that allow for impartiality, gratitude, uh, forgiveness, empathy, and unbiased compassion. And CBCT recognizes a biologically given potential for compassion that we all have, uh, but employs deliberate training to expand this capacity be the, beyond the limits of in-group, out-group bias. Um, so there are five components to CBCT. I'm not going to go into this in any great detail. We have um, several um, publications that outline these stages and what they mean. But it begins with developing attentional stability, mindfulness of the breath and mindfulness and introspective vigilance, resting the mind in its natural state in a way that's very similar to um, MBSR and also to the Shamatha project. Um, then it starts introducing uh, analytical meditation. So uh, this basis of mindfulness, this basic skill of being able to hold something in working memory where it can then be processed and analyzed and changed, um, and then those new insights integrated, that um, happens first through the cultivation of self-compassion, which uh, in our protocol means recognizing that there are causes of suffering and unhappiness that don't just merely have to do with external circumstances, but have to do with our own emotions, our emotional responses, our ways of viewing the world, and then resolving to transform one's destructive emotions and cultivate constructive emotions. Um, for the um, Buddhist scholars among you, um, this is actually um, a, a, an adaptation from the concept of, um, of renunciation. Um, Nijung, um, except not in uh, a kind of, not in a Buddhist uh, sense of emerging from samsara, but, um, but in this, um, however one understands uh, the transformation of one's own destructive emotions, which could be right in the, in the here and now in this life. And then third, uh, developing impartiality, breaking down in-group, out-group bias, breaking down our tendency to see the world in terms of uh, near and dear ones, uh, strangers to whom we feel indifferent, and then enemies to whom we have difficulty extending compassion. Developing affectionate love and empathy, which is um, seeing others as precious, seeing others as very dear to ourselves, uh, and then um, using that as a basis for empathy. And then strengthening compassion. Once we have a deeper understanding of suffering, then um, uh, and then also a, a, a deeper sense of connection with others than compassion, the ingredients for compassion are there. Um, so um, um, I'm going to run through uh, some of this uh, data quickly. Uh, this is um, uh, results from a TSST, which was mentioned in the Shamata project uh, by Cliff um, during the discussion, a trio social stress test. So these are... Um, um, uh, this is a measure um, looking at a biomarker for inflammation, uh, interleukin-6, um, uh, from comparing um, the compassion uh, training group to a control group. And um, high inflammation 
uh, when the body doesn't need to have high inflammation as an immune response is uh, negatively uh, is um, is associated with all sorts of negative health co outcomes, including Alzheimer's, depression, and so on. Um, and this shows that um, uh, in one of our studies, comparing the compassion meditation group to uh, control group, um, those who actually practiced the compassion meditation um, sh uh, came in with much lower levels of inflammation. Um, despite the psychosocial stress they were exposed to, uh, they uh, emerged with, uh, still with low levels of inflammation. And even though there was a slight elevation later on, they remained significantly bo below uh, the control group. Um, which is interesting because these are people who are coming in who um, do not have prior meditation experience, and then they're randomized. Now, uh, in our current studies, they're actually randomized to three groups. One is a compassion group. One is a mindfulness and attention training only group, which um, Alan Wallace actually helped us design. And the third is a health education discussion group. Uh, so these are people who are coming in because they have no prior uh, meditation experience. Uh, almost none of them are Buddhist as a result because um, uh, to be a Western Buddhist and not meditate is unthinkable <laughs> in our culture. Um, so just as a result, they end up not being Buddhist. Um, so uh, this is um, uh, looking at um, subjective report of distress. We see the, sim the similar results. Um, this is looking at empathic accuracy, which is interesting. Um, uh, they're shown a picture of um, people's eyes. It's called reading in the mind in the eyes task. And they have to guess um, which emotion this person is uh, experiencing. Can any of you guess? Playful, playful, comforting, irritated, or bored? Okay, you're all very good at this. Yeah, it's, it's A, it's playful. Um, so we see a, a, an increase in empathic accuracy as opposed to the control. We also see more activation in putative mirror neuron areas of the brain, um, which we believe are associated with empathy. Um, uh, this is an interesting result showing that um, those who engaged in mindfulness attention training showed uh, reduced uh, reactivity in the amygdala to uh, negative, positive, and neutral stimuli. Um, and this is a, um, a depression score. Um, those in the compassion training group, interestingly enough, showed reductions in the neutral and uh, positive stimuli, reductions in amygdala activation, but not to uh, negative stimuli. Although that was correlated with a, uh, a reduction in their depression score. Um, the way that the, uh, the first author on this paper, who's Gail Debord, the way she interpreted this to, was, um, I believe, to, to um, she speculates that the people in the compassion training are actually able to re retain high sensitivity to, the, to the, these distress, uh, these negative stimuli, which are like women screaming uh, or, you know, and all these kinds of things. Um, and yet, actually, they're not reacting. The, the kind of negative um, response to that is not being shown. So they still have sensitivity. They're not just down-regulating all response to stimuli, which is interesting. Um, we've also brought this into um, to education. Um, uh, here's uh, Brooke and myself in a class with, um, with uh, Richard Moore, who's um, the fellow that um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama calls um, um, his hero uh, because of his embodiment of forgiveness. Um, but this is us uh, teaching CBCT in a... Uh, in a classroom setting. And what we did there was um, we tried to teach the entire protocol, but um, using uh, language that children could understand. So here we're trying to teach uh, how meditation doesn't involve being distracted, or crazy thoughts where you're too excited, but it also doesn't mean falling asleep, which is um, something that kids sometimes think. You know, you get them to sit down and close their eyes, and they think, oh, it's nap time. Uh, and we get them to draw that um, out so that they can understand that. They have to draw those concepts. Um, and the idea is that we're cultivating mindfulness here, uh, not just to be aware of the present moment, but specifically so we can catch and defuse triggers. So this is where the moral and ethical dimension comes in, that there are uh, certain emotional and behavioral responses that are not conducive to our well-being or the well-being of others. We need to identify those, and we need to catch those, just like a spark can turn into a forest fire. Uh, but if we catch it when it's a spark, we can put it out. If we wait till it's a forest fire, it wrecks havoc on our lives. In the same way, destructive emotions affect us in that way. And so we're training to be forest rangers in the, uh, the forest of our minds. Um,
and kids really get this. The other thing is uh, teaching the concept of interdependence by taking uh, any object, uh, whatever the child likes, placing that in the middle of a big sheet of paper, and we ask them to draw all the things that that depends on. So these are what I'm showing you here is the, is the content that we teach, but then they practice this also in meditation itself. And that's what I mean by analytical meditation. So within the guided meditation, they're actually trying to bring these concepts and then bring about new perspectives, such as a perspective of interdependence. And um, we're still analyzing the data from uh, uh, our child study, which we ran in um, spring. Uh, we did it in two classes. Again, we used a mindfulness attention program as the control, and, um, uh, and two, two other classes received the compassion um, uh, curriculum. Um, here's one of the results, uh, which we have analyzed, which is a social circles task looking at um, place the child is asked to put himself or herself in the middle, and then they talk about people that they feel close to, people who feel less close to, people that they um, don't think about that often and don't feel that close to. Um, and this is, you need to come up with things like this for five, six, seven-year-old kids. Because, you know, giving them a self a hundred question self-report scale doesn't really work that well. Um, and hooking up to them to scanners is a little tricky, although you can do that. Um, this is uh, the example in the social circles test that I just showed you, um, where we saw that um, um, the um, children in the CBCT group were two and a quarter times more likely to name a peer as a friend than were children in the control, uh, control group. Um, the other thing is that um, uh, the children showed an increase in their uh, number of close friends <coughs> while decreasing the number of not close friends, in, um, and particularly in their classroom. So in other words, p they moved children from the outer ring towards the inner ring. And they also uh, had more mutual friendships um, and more friendship, that means mutual friendships, meaning one child putting another child in the classroom as a friend and the other ch child doing the same. And also they had more cross-gender friendships, which is interesting in this age group. It's kind of unusual. Um, one thing that we're analyzing right now is uh, doing narrative analysis, uh, uh, similar to the coding that uh, Virginia was talking about, where they are given a moral dilemma, um, like um, Sally is, um, playing with her friend Susie, and Sally's younger sister comes over and says, I want to play with you too. And Susie says, uh, no, your sister can't play with us. If she plays with us, then I'm leaving. And then what should Sally do? She, you know? And uh, so these kind of open-ended moral dilemmas are presented to the children, and children talk. Uh, we then transcribe their responses, and we, we then code them for various things um, like uh, ego, ego, egocentrism and sociality, impartiality, um, uh, perspective taking, compassion, moral reasoning, deference to authority, and things like that. Um, and uh, what we um, uh, believe is happening through our pre preliminary analysis is that, and these are coded by blind coders, of course, who don't know uh, which, which group the children were in, um, is that um, is a movement from um, uh, ideas of deference to authority and very rigid rules of what's right and wrong towards more fluid uh, sense uh, of moral reasoning that's based on perspective taking, empathy, impartiality, and compassion. If that holds up, then that would be very exciting because that would be further evidence supporting the idea that, um, that the teaching of secular ethics as the teaching of uh, basic human values uh, is possible through uh, programs like CBCT. So I want to um, close with that question about what it means uh, when we have meditation programs that are explicitly about values. Um, Geshe Jinpa, in one of his comments, uh, rightly said that mindfulness-based interventions like MBSR do have an implicit value system, no matter how much they try to say sometimes, or some proponents try to say that this is, you know, totally a neutral practice, there is certainly an underlying value system. But in protocols like CBCT, the values are very explicit. It's an explicitly normative um, meditation program in the sense that the whole objective of the protocol is to cultivate unbiased universal compassion. Um, one of the um, interesting things is that if we look at work in cultural psychology and psycho psychological anthropology, um, researchers in these fields have noted cross-cultural differences in things such as construals of, of selfhood, like Marcus and Kitayama's work on independent versus interdependent uh, construals of selfhood, perception and cognition, such as Nisbet's work, 
um, and emotion styles such as uh, Liu's work um, showing East Asians as having more dialectical emotion styles versus um, uh, Westerners having non-dialectical emotions. And what he means by that is that um, uh, when, you, when you look at correlations of positive emotions and negative emotions to things like depression, you see a similar cor correlation of negative emotions, but you don't see positive emotions being um, uh, as negatively correlated with depression among East Asians as you do among Westerners. So his, his theory of that is that um, um, uh, in uh, some Asian cultures, there might be the mo this more, more of this idea that you know, when, th when everything's going great and you're feeling happy, uh, that's not really necessary to kind of um, get so excited about that and get all carried away with that happiness because it's transient and so forth, um, as opposed to um, uh, in the West where there might be more of this, you know, positive and negative emotions are seen more as opposites rather than in a dialectical way. The classical image of that is the yin-yang kind of symbol. Um, now, what's interesting about this, in my opinion, is that maybe... Um, these are things that are not necessarily fixed based on uh, cultural groups like Easterners and Westerners and Asians and so on and so forth, but um, that these are actual um, uh, cultural values and um, tendencies and traits that are amenable to change through contemplative practice. So um, typically we think of cu culture as bounded within sociolinguistic, ethnic, or national groups. So we talk about Japanese culture, American culture. Um, or, we might, um, or we might talk about uh, Buddhist culture, maybe. Um, but it's also possible for us to think about culture in terms of shared values. And that's what's happening when somebody talks about a culture of compassion. Um, and it's this latter understanding of culture, I think, that's embedded in contemplative practices and that can become instilled in practitioners. So I think um, when His Holiness the Dalai Lama, for example, talks about the need to preserve Tibetan culture, uh, I'm not sure that he's talking about um, their uh, folk dances, uh, interesting as those are, and their style of traditional dress, but really the fact that uh, Tibetan culture has become influenced uh, by certain practices that, that, uh, and, and that, for example, promote compassion, and that compassion then becomes a cultural value that uh, has become instilled in the society. So the promotion of universal human values to uh, affect a cultural shift towards a culture of compassion is, in my understanding, the very idea behind secular ethics. And uh, this isn't unrelated to uh, health and the health benefits and the here and now benefits, uh, because as we're increasingly learning, um, positive emotion, social connection, and so forth are um, constitutive of flourishing and positive mental health, which is increasingly being seen to be preventive for the arising of mental illness and possibly even physical illness and uh, other problems like suicide. So it's possible, as Geshe Jinpa alluded to, that um, religious practices um, are, have, have tied, have, have drawn upon certain practices for the cultivation of values that are more basic than the, than the religions themselves, that are more universal, more rooted in the, in the human condition than the religions themselves, and Buddhism might be an example of that. Uh, if that's the case, then those practices could be extracted out of the Buddhist context and applied more universally. They don't necessarily need to be tied to the religion of Buddhism itself. And they also don't need to be shorn from any kind of ethical or moral content either. They can remain um, ethically uh, and morally grounded. So, in other words, contemporary mindfulness and compassion practices do reflect cultural values that are valorized in the Buddhist tradition. But that doesn't mean that they can't be secular as well. Um, one of, uh, some of the work that I find very interesting uh, at Emory is work by uh, Franz Duval, who's a comparative psychologist and primatologist, who is looking at the roots of morality in 
uh, non-human primates and in monkeys, where and his um, in 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 seeing how concepts like fairness and targeted helping and so forth appear uh, in these non-human animal species also, and his argument is that. Um, the, maybe not full-fledged, what we would consider full-fledged morality, but the, the basic constituents of morality we can already find there uh, in the animal uh, kingdom prior to, to uh, human beings, um, and that this can be traced at least as far back as the last common ancestor between mammals and birds, because that would be uh, uh, the point at which the survival of our species as mammals and birds depends on maternal care. So we as uh, human beings cannot survive without care, without some degree of biological compassion. And therefore, this is something that's very deep-seated in us. Um, in fact, it's, it's so deeply seated in, in us and so deeply connected to our survival that social death, social isolation and rejection, and physical death are very closely tied uh, in our minds. The, the, the very idea of suicide, for example, uh, that someone would commit suicide because of social shame or social rejection, which happens like the that unfortunate story of the uh, the college student who was kind of you know video or something was posted on Facebook. Some his roommate had filmed him and then you know called him out as being gay and he committed suicide. So the idea that someone would choose physical death over social death or the fear of social death uh, really gets at the heart of how central compassion is. How, uh, how central our connection with other humans be, uh, uh, is for us, that it's intimately uh, tied to our survival. And the evolutionary argument makes that. Also work in developmental psychology by people like Philippe Rochat and others show, who are arguing that our idea of cognition is, is based on an adult model where uh, other people are just among other things that I cognize, so social cognition is just kind of one category of cognition, as opposed to the idea that that our cognition and consciousness develops in an inherently social way because, you know, when we're in the womb, for example, there's no such thing as cognition outside of person perception and, and interpersonal cognition, and also when we're a baby. Um, so that social consciousness and social cognition and individual cognition can't really be separated. I think this kind of work um, shows to the, um, to the centrality of um, compassion as understanding it as just a basic kind of um, biological aspect of, of being a human being. Now, that doesn't mean that higher order conceptions of compassion might not vary widely across cultures and religions. Uh, I will end my presentation there, and uh, thank you all for your attention.